Delight to be here with you. Uh, 2013 has come and is almost gone. Uh, maybe you had some good intentions at the beginning of the year. Whether some of those were fulfilled or not, don't know. All I know is this. It's almost over, guys. <laughs> and Christmas 2014 is right around the corner. Real. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, this we are assured of in the Word of God, that the Lord Jesus Christ is in our next year. And He invites us in and says, it's all right, I'm here. Amen. By the way, Patsy's son and daughter-in-law and grandchildren are here today. And we're so glad to have you here from Alaska. All right. Amen. Amen. I hope I didn't miss anybody else, but uh, we're just glad to have you. Oh, yes. Yes, Kayla. How are you doing, girl? God bless your little gizzard. You are really something, and your fiancé is here with you. God bless you. We welcome you again. Amen. Good to have each and every one. Praise the Lord. Luke is a, 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 a trained physician. As we look back at the, at the Gospel of Luke, trained physician. He knows his stuff. He uh, a very wise uh, man. Uh, very, very uh, intelligent. And as time began to pass away there after the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord and his ascension on high, some of the apostles, uh, you know, they had been preaching that Christ would return and their thought was he would return at any moment. And the fact of the matter is, as time began to progress and, and time uh, passed, uh, many of them begin to understand and know that perhaps they would personally not see the return of the Lord, maybe the next generation. And so as the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon their hearts and their lives, many of these begin to write things concerning their experiences, concerning what the Lord was laying upon their heart. And the gospel writers, moved by the power of the Spirit of the Lord, begin to write these things and and there were all kinds of false writings that arose about the same time and kind of a lot of fables and fairy tales and so forth. And Luke, one day, he just says, you know what? It's time to lay this down, lay some of those goofy stories to rest and tell what really happened. And he began to interview many of the eyewitnesses, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and many others. He interviewed them, and he began to write down what their experience was. And he himself had been... Uh, there and seen some of these things and so he writes the gospel of Luke and also uh, it's the second volume the uh, were Acts called Acts of the Apostles so as, as he writes this down carefully he wants the following generations to know really what happened and he talks about Jesus Christ and what happened and Luke is a gospel of um, of great hope See, when hope had been lost and then hope was found again and it was announced by the angels that in the city of David was born the Messiah, the Christ, the sent one, the anointed one, the eternal one. Um, it, it was good news and hope began to spring up in hopeless hearts. And so we pick it up at chapter 24, verse number 1, the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, now the simple phraseology that is used here is very important because there had arisen several various groups of people who thought that it was uh, difficult for anyone to believe that God had really died upon that cross. And so what they came up with a theory, they came up with the, uh, the theory that Jesus the man had lived his life, come to the river of Jordan, and when he was uh, there in the river and the Holy Spirit came upon him, that it was the Spirit of God that possessed him. Because God couldn't die, remember, in their hearts and their minds and their understanding and their logic. How many of you know our logic gets away with us sometimes? Gets away from us. Anyway, they said that, that this, uh, this uh, combination creature was here and he lived this life and ministered powerfully under the unction of Holy Spirit who possessed him. And when he came to the cross, because, Christ, uh, the, because God could not die, Holy Spirit left the man Jesus 
who died as a man because remember God couldn't die and then when they put him in the tomb on the third day Holy Spirit came back and raised him from the dead now that was a, a logical misunderstanding that they put upon the story of Jesus and what Luke wanted to make certain that those who read his gospel understood is that Jesus was all God and all man when Holy Spirit came upon Virgin Mary and that egg in her womb became alive unctionized by the Spirit of God and came forth the seed of the woman bearing precious blood untainted unstained by human sin all the rest of us born into sin original sin were stained with sin because of our original parents and so on but the fact is Jesus blood was pure and holy and undefiled and because of that when he all God all man in the face of the earth went to the cross suffered therefore as he bore all of our sins all of our shame all of our guilt he took it upon himself paid the debt to the law the law of God which said the soul that sin shall surely die he paid the thing off guys and because of that was able to give up the ghost to die in faith believing that his father who sent him would also raise him they put him in the tomb and on that third day the spirit of Jesus came back animated again the body of Christ he was changed from mortal to immortal and he arose from the dead and 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 would be with his disciples for some 40 days and then ascend into heaven and there he sits as the song sang this morning interceding for us with his heavenly father what a powerful powerful picture but Luke is very careful to say the body of Christ was not there there's great meaning behind this and he was defeating some of the heretical teachings that were going on at that time and verse number four and it happened uh, and by the way just let me back up and, and and say this about the tomb in those days they would hollow out an area in a rock face or in the side of a hill they would put a little uh, ante room and the custom was uh, in that area on the one of the walls or more one or more of the walls they would uh, cut out a niche maybe six seven feet long like a shelf and when a person was buried they would smear uh, oils and resins and such in their body spices wrap it in linen place it on the shelf and then uh, cover the opening so the scavengers could not get in and as the body decayed it would turn to bones finally they would go in collect the bones put them in an ossuary sometimes a a um, a box a, a stone box uh, carved out with a lid on it and they would put that in the corner and then put the next body in there uh, when someone passed and so forth or they would collect the bones in piles in the back of the tomb and the word of the Lord in prophecy hundreds of years before said that a new tomb would be used to bury the beloved of the Lord and that it was a rich man's tomb it exactly fit the bill exactly what happened and so the Lord was in a, a place where death had never touched it before but death would be defeated in the death of the Lord Jesus aren't you glad for that see we know the end of the story they didn't then and here's what occurred the women came back to further anoint the body somehow they were gonna beg somebody roll the stone back we're gonna get in and put more spices because we want to honor the life of our Lord and it happened verse 4 as they were <clears throat> and they were greatly perplexed about not seeing the body there that behold two men stood by them in shining garments these were angels and then as they were they, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth they said to them I, I, I think if if you really saw an angel and you were in a really upset place and you'd probably hit the ground too wouldn't you think just thinking about it a moment and they said why do you seek the living among the dead he is not here but risen and remember see friends I'm talking to you this morning about hope awakens to miracles hope awakens to miracles when a miracle happens hope rises up within us again and this is exactly what was occurring in the hearts of the people who were hearing the reports hope began to rise up in the presence of miracles and so they said uh, he is not here he is risen remember what he said while he was still with you in Galilee verse 7 the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and 
be crucified, and the third day rise again. You see, friends, he had made the announcement over and over and over again, four distinct times that we know for certain. We're going to Jerusalem, going to be delivered in the hands of evil men. Uh, they're going to, to abuse me and, and speak ill against me and so forth and, and kill me. But don't worry about it. The third day I'll rise again. Those were things he told them. But have you ever been told something and it didn't, it didn't sink in? Hello? Did your mom and dad ever tell you da-da-da-da-da-da and you go, I never heard that. <laughs> yeah, went one ear and out the other, you know, just like that. And, and, or, or maybe you knew something, to, were told something, and sometime down the road, all of a sudden it dawned on you. And we say that, it dawned on me. <gasps> wow, yeah, okay, now I understand. What was happening is they had the information, but no connection. Has it ever happened to you? Information, but no connection. And something spurious came along, and all of a sudden there was a connection, and you understood. That's what was happening. Don't blame them that they didn't believe what Jesus said. It just didn't dawn on them that this was entirely possible. And in their sorrow of losing Jesus, they were in deep, deep complex, a, a deep sorrow of heart and soul. But now, don't you remember what he said the third day he would rise? Verse 8, And they remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And amongst them, listen, the, these women were the ones who had been at the tomb. Mary Magdalene, remember? She was the one who was possessed with seven demons. And Jesus healed her, cast those seven demons out. Seven is, is the number of completion. And when it says seven demons, whether they were literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or whatever, it means that she was completely possessed and controlled by demonic forces. And on the other hand, when the Lord delivered her and set her free, the complete demonic control was broken. Not a shred of it remained, and she was delivered totally and set free. Aren't you glad when Jesus comes to you and to me, he doesn't do half a job? He does it completely and perfectly. Mary Magdalene was there amongst the women. And then Joanna. Joanna her story is strange. She is the wife of Chuzza, a man named Chuzza, who happened to be the steward. He was in charge of the household of King Herod. Now, King Herod hated what was going on with Jesus and the disciples and all that kind of stuff. Remember, he's the guy that had the, the head of John the Baptist taken and all that kind of stuff. And, and let me tell you, the guy was a real jerk. Sorry. The Bible doesn't say that, but I'm telling you, he was a jerk. And King Herod had a steward, the guy he trusted completely, totally, absolutely, who was in charge of all of his household things in the entire palace. And the wife of that steward had come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't you know that in the darkest corner, there is a hungry heart and soul that will respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and be set free? Don't you know that in the most impossible situations, God can find a hungry heart and there plant a seed and in the darkest spot on the face of the earth can bring forth light and life in the midst of overwhelming darkness. Light will shine. I could preach on that just by itself, but I'm not going to do it. And Mary, the mother of James. Mary, the mother of James. James, the son of Alphaeus. Mary was also the sister of the Virgin Mary. And so um, James had become an apostle. Uh, James, the less he's called. And the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words, verse number 11, their words seemed to them like idle tales. Oh, they're just women talking. Ah, it's just a little hen fest. Have you ever denigrated women, guys, and talked about women like that? Let, 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 let's stop that. Let's not do this, that here at Abundant Grace. Let's begin to honor our women truly as the help meets God has given us to help us sometimes dunder our heads to get through life. Everybody said amen. Okay. And... So, but they thought they were just telling idle tales and they did not believe them. Belief, my friend, is a choice. I believe you or I choose not to believe you. And when, when they said they did not believe them, in, in the Greek it means they were unable to be persuaded. 
their opinion, their attitude. It, they were unable to be shaken from their opinion or their attitude. They did not believe them. It was a choice that they made. But watch what happens. See, hope awakens to miracles. Hope awakens to miracles. And watch this carefully as it says this. Um, but Peter arose. Peter, the impetuous Peter, little bald-headed, bow-legged guy, always first to jump at the first instant anything happened. Uh, when Jesus said, we're going we're gonna to have trouble, Peter goes, I got a sword. See, I'm ready to go. And then when they got in the garden and the, and the guards came, remember, he, he swung at the high priest's servant's head and missed and cut off his ear, and Jesus had to fix that and everything, you know. And so Peter was always first to jump. Well, somehow, hope ignited down within his spirit, and he jumps up, and he arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. John's gospel says that not only were the linen clothes laying in one place, but the head handkerchief that wrapped the head of Jesus was lying separate from that. Again, trying to under, make people understand this was not a grave robbery. Robbers come in, they throw things all over the place, and they skedaddle, and everything's a mess. No, 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 this was neatly taken care of in the tomb. Clothes here, napkin that wrapped his head here. And besides, by the way, we know from historical perspective that carpenters would wear an apron when they worked and when they got done they would take it off fold it carefully lay it aside indicating the job was done and completed and I suggest to you this morning that when Jesus rose from the dead he carefully put those clothes to one place and took that napkin and folded and put it aside just so anyone looking in the tomb would know all done <laughs> we got it together something's happened here that's powerful and supernatural and that's what Peter saw. And then watch at verse number 13 as we come to this, please. Hope awakens to his presence. There's something about the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that sinks down into the searching, hungry heart and assures that individual that there is more to life than simply get up, Work your day, go to bed at night, wake up again hopeless and go about the same thing all over again. Something about the presence of the Lord brings not only a hope that remains and grows, but also stirs the hope that something is beginning to occur and happen in that precious life. I have seen the person most lost and most undone, no matter the level of their sin, but I have seen them feel at their total worst come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and have their hearts and lives turned around when they realize His presence was reality and it stirred their hope within them. Hope awakens to His presence. Verse number 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. We know one of the men here was... Um, Cleopas and uh, Cleopas and we think the other was Luke we don't know that the second person for certain but we're pretty uh, pretty well uh, convinced that it is him and uh, Cleopas again was the father of the Apostle James the less and uh, husband to Mary the sister of the Virgin Mary and Jesus uncle by the way which was seven miles Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem Verse 14, and they talked together of all the things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed. And it was common Jewish custom to walk along the road and converse with one another, especially talking about the law of God and so forth, uh, that they would just converse and, and uh, commune with one another on it and reasoned. That Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And Mark's gospel says that he appeared in another form. In other words, in a way that they did not recognize his visage. His, his, his looks were, were somehow different. They did not recognize him. Their eyes were restrained. Verse 17, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? What are we talking about, guys? What are you discussing? And Jesus will often come to you and to me, and he will ask us questions to penetrate our hearts. How many of us have ever uh, just uh, not felt on top of things? And someone will say, what's wrong? You go, eh, I don't know. 
I don't know. The other day we, we drove back into town and, and Letha wanted to stop and get an uh, In-N-Out burger. And I just, she said, what do you want? And I said, eh, nothing. I just, well, why? I don't I just don't feel well. Well, are you sick? No, I just don't, I don't feel, I don't, I don't know what the deal is. I just didn't feel up to it. And to offer me an In-N-Out burger and I refuse it, uh, that takes something, guys. Just let me tell you right now. Anyway, but you've been there. You just don't know what's going on. And uh, he said, Jesus will often ask you questions to find out what's in you. Because often when you answer the Lord in prayer, in a journal, prayer journal, whatever it may be, when you answer what the Lord is questioning you about, oftentimes you will discover what's on the inside of you. Something that's been just kind of banging around inside like a handful of marbles in a washing machine, you know, just can't quite put your finger on it, but it really needs to be addressed. And the Lord will say, hey, what's up? And you, as you begin to express that to him, oftentimes you can discover what's in the depth of your heart and spirit. Let me tell you, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Sometimes you really need to listen to what you're saying to someone else to discover what's in your own heart. Sometimes your opinion will shock you. Have you ever been there? Well, I feel like, so, well, where'd that come from? Don't know. May have come from someone else's influence. May have come from a disappointment or a wounding of your heart and spirit. Listen, anytime the Lord reveals something to you, he will bring it forth, reminding you in order to heal it. Are you listening, folks? God will remind you of something not to condemn you, but to heal you and set you free. And so the Lord said, what are you talking about? Verse 18, then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened in these last days? Like, what's the matter? Are you new in town? You haven't heard? And he said to them, what things? See, Jesus will continue to further define what comes out of your heart. Why do you feel that way? What, why is that your attitude? What is at the root of that situation? And let God be your own counselor, my precious friend, to bring forth these things. And then um, notice they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. The Greek that is used here means genuine, genuine prophet. No question at all. By his deeds, by his acts, the Greek is very, very clear. A genuine prophet. Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. And see, oftentimes the people had a thought about Christ. He's going to do X, Y, Z. And the Lord never does according to our expectations. He does according to what his plan and his will is. And it's so much better than ours. Oftentimes I have dug a channel, concreted in the sides, and said, Holy Spirit, here's where my answer can flow, so go ahead and flow here. And the Lord diverts the flow so that it flows elsewhere. Because see, God doesn't want your plan or your agenda or mine. He wants his agenda and plan. And when he flows in our hearts and lives, he does such a much better job of it than what I plan for you. Friend, precious friend, listen carefully this morning. The Lord will work his works in our lives. And they said, we were hoping. Cleopas opens his own heart. We, we thought it would be. We hoped it would be this way. Who would redeem Israel? And indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us, absolutely amazed us. And when they did not find his body, again, Luke is getting that item in there, did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they, him they did not see. You see, you see, friends, um, it's okay to show your disappointment to God. Any of you have ever expected one thing and received another, and there was disappointment in your spirit? It's okay to be disappointed with God. But bring that disappointment to Him because He'll begin to reveal to you maybe some things that stand in the way. Maybe some things that can be taken care of. Maybe you've not prayed about the situation. Oftentimes, we pray last instead of first. 
Ooh, that probably hit a nerve somewhere. Sometimes we have a situation, and when you're asked, did you pray about it, we'll go, uh, no. Friends, it's always wise to pray first and hear the voice of the Lord. It'll save you time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears. It'll save you all kinds of confusion. It will save you everything. Watch this. And then verse 25, Then he said to them, O foolish ones. Now, we have the idea that fool means you idiot, you. That's not how he meant it here. It means, it means from the Greek, it means that you're inconsiderate and thoughtless. O inconsiderate, thoughtless persons, he says to them. And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, the Christ, to have suffered these things and to, uh, and to enter his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see, he was the only answer to sin. He was the only answer to problems in the world. Only he. And he went through the gospel. He went through the Torah, the writings of Moses. He went through the prophets. He went through the Psalms. He went through all of those. And item by item by item by item by item, he explained who he was and why he had come. He began to open their attention because you see presence, uh, the presence of the Lord causes hope to awaken. The presence of the Lord causes hope to awaken. But aren't you glad that the Lord dealt with such doubters? That he revealed himself to them? Listen, friends, if you got the yes club, they'll say yes to anything. Yeah, 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 let's do that. Let's go jump off a cliff. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, people will agree to anything. But doubters are the kinds who take time and think about it and wonder about it. These doubters, these people who question, and friends, you can question God and it's okay. Because God has the answer. In fact, he is the answer. And if you question him with an open, hungry heart, he'll reveal the answers to you. He will satisfy the hungry heart. But these doubters were the first witnesses to hear the reports and eventually to believe them. These doubters were the first witnesses to proclaim these reports as true because hope had arisen within them because hope was awakened by miracles. Hope was a, 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 awakens to his presence. Hope began to work within their hearts so that they were even able to die on the evidence of these truths that were revealed to them. Verse number 28, watch this carefully, is hope awakens to remembrance. Hope awakens to remembrance. And then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, please, for it is towards evening. The day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them in probably the home of Cleopas. And now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And here's what happened, friends. When you sit down to meal at another person's house, you do not take charge. Only the master, the father of the home, the head of the table, does the thing about whatever happens to, at the place. And Jesus sat here. He reaches for the bread. He takes it. He breaks it. He blesses it. And he passes it to them. And all of a sudden, in verse um, 31, Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Eyes open. Let me tell you, friends, when, when, when you begin to have that kind of relationship with God, when he begins to reveal things to you and show you things, you understand that his presence is powerful. And it begins to awaken things within you. And he reminds you of those things. He puts you in mind of the miracles that occurred, the wondrous grace that he showed you in your life and your family. How wonderful is his presence. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, their eyes were opened. Hearts were unveiled. Revelation came. Remembrance happened. Listen, friends, I've had miracles in my life. How about some of you this morning? Some of you, I've been there in the presence of your miracles. And thank God for that. But let me tell you what. Miracles occur and thank God for them but I don't have to live for the next miracle. 
I'm not going, oh my God, I can't wait till the next miracle so I can have some victory in my life. If I lived like that, I'd be constantly depressed because you never know when the next miracle is going to occur. But rather, I have found from the Word of God that I live in the blessing of God and in the favor of God. And therefore, thank God for the miracles, but my life does not depend upon the next miracle occurring. I have His blessing now. I have His favor now, and I walk in it, don't you? Ah, and because of that, what, what can possibly get us down when His presence has blessed us with His grace and His favor? Oh, hear the word of the Lord. So what happened? Did not our hearts burn within us? And they were so excited that they rose up that very hour in, in spite of the seven-mile run back to the city, in spite of the dangers on the road, in spite of the darkness. They arise and return to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. And this is what the group was, was talking about and rejoicing in. The Lord is risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon, Simon Peter. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. They shared in the group, he truly is. We've seen him. Here's what happened to us. In verse number 36, hope awakens to evidence. Hope awakens to evidence shown to them. Listen to this. And now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them a very common Hebrew blessing peace to you peace to you what this involves it means this this jewish blessing uh, and and um, and greeting it means may you prosper in body and soul and enjoy every heavenly and earthly good may you prosper in body and soul and enjoy every heavenly and earthly good and when Jesus said that to their hearts, all of a sudden, they began to awaken. Hope began to awaken to the evidence in front of them. Here is the risen Lord. But maybe he could be a ghost. And Jesus knew that. And so he responds. As he stands in their midst, they were terrified and frightened, verse 37. And suppose that they had seen a spirit, but he said to them, why are you troubled? See, when God shows up, why does it surprise us? When God shows up, why does it take us by surprise? He's with us, friends. He's here already. He doesn't have to show up. He's here. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am where? In the midst of you. There he is. And why do doubts arise in your heart? God doesn't put us down for our doubts. He lifts us up from our doubts. Behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Listen, friends, we're animated. We have several doctors in the congregation. We have uh, uh, several scientifically minded folk, and you all know this, just the common man knows this, that, that we're animated by our blood. Drain my blood, I'm done. I'm down on my I'm on the ground. <laughs> it's all over. But here's Jesus. His blood was drained upon the cross. He shed that precious blood for all of us. What is he animated by? He's animated by the Spirit of God. He doesn't say, I'm flesh and blood. He says, I'm flesh and bone. Think about it for a moment. And in that, earth, in that earthly body, we need the blood. But in that heavenly body, that resurrected body, that immortal, immortal flesh will be animated by spirit, not by blood. Watch a little further, please. Verse 40, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Evidence, hope awakens to evidence. And but they were, were, but while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? See, you see, they had they'd seen him with their eyes. They heard him speak. They understood his presence. They saw him now in their presence. He says, I've got to do something to really bring them back, their attention back to what's happening. Have you any food here? And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. It's not that he was hungry. It's that he wanted them to see. A spirit doesn't take food, but the resurrected body can. And he said, I can do this. And in the taking of that food in their presence, he shared with them in that food. And sharing food is a very personal thing. From the moment a baby begins to suckle at its mother's breast, 
to the moment that we sit at table and take our first solid food, to the moment that we have our family uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas dinners, and so forth. We love to be together at the table. That's what we're going to do in a few moments with communion. We're going to be at the table of the Lord together. And friends, I want you to know and understand something. They saw that. They recognized that. And they knew that they knew that they knew the Lord had risen indeed. Notice with me in verse number 44. As hope awakens to teaching, he's going to begin to bring some get things together for them. Hope awakens to teaching. And he said to them, there are, uh, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. The Greek says he opened their understanding fully. He opened their understanding fully. They did, just didn't get a hold of it. They got it. It was revealed to them. And so then in verse 46, and he says to them, Thus it is written, And it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. It was necessary. Why? Because God did something about the sin that beguiled us. He did something about that which crushed us. He did something about that which inundated us with fear and kept us in bondage. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. At the place of the worst juncture of time for Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Jerusalem, he put the seed of forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you remember? In the place of his worst defeat, he brought light and peace and hope and joy. In the place where you've had your worst failure, Jesus says, I want to break my light in the midst of that so that it will no longer be a thing of guilt or shame, but it will be a place where you can rejoice that God who loves you most loves you completely to the uttermost and has set you free. In the place of your greatest fear, light breaks forth in fearful places I'll give you strength and courage in places of memorial places of defeat I'll bring victory for you see the Spirit of the Lord wants us to know he's with us in every place quickly please as I just come to my conclusion this morning and he says, And that repentance remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. We know between this verse and the last that there are 40 days that the risen Lord is with them, teaching, instructing them in righteousness. And finally, finally in verse 50, hope awakens in worship. Hope awakens in worship. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them and he, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Friends, hope awakens to miracles. Hope awakens to his presence. Hope re awakens to remembrance. Hope awakens to evidence. Hope awakens to teaching. Hope Hope awakens in worship. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Friends, he didn't come just to save us. He didn't come just to give us heaven as our eternal home. He came to give us the understanding and the knowledge that he who started a good work in us will complete it and bring it to completion in Christ Jesus. Friends, he didn't just show up one day and save your soul and take away your fear, your guilt, and your shame. He said, I will be with you forever and forever to the end of the age. The presence of God is what gives us the victory on a day-to-day -day basis. The presence of God is what flows within us and causes us to arise in our most holy faith. It's His presence. It's His presence that is the fruit of His grace in our lives. Oh, it's the evidence. It's the evidence. He who is in us that is, is greater than he that is in the world. I just ask across the congregation this morning, you may be here today and you may have no hope. Maybe you had hope at one time and you've lost it. But you need to know and understand that God is for you, not against you. And you may be here thinking, 
happen? What can I do about this situation? Friend, I'm telling you that Jesus Christ is the answer. Not just for this moment, but for all your life. He's your answer. His presence is what destroys the darkness, the fear, and the gloom. His presence is what brings you peace. His presence is what brings you power.